la universidad es un lugar de innovación. Por eso innovación y universidad son la misma cosa. En estudios políticos y relaciones internacionales de la Universidad Francisco Marroquín, los estudiantes son los dueños de su proyecto académico. We've developed incredible curriculum, we've developed incredible outreach. Es la carrera del futuro de alguien que quiera adentrarse en el apasionante mundo de los estudios políticos con la libertad como eje central. Good afternoon and good night um, if you're in Europe. Thank you very much for joining us in our conversation of today. Um, today we're going to be talking about a fascinating subject. What is the role of the monarchy in the 21st century? This question must be answered for those who oppose it and indeed by the supporters of the institution. In the age of rage for equality, Monarchy could sound like something out of date. A couple of years ago, the Democracy Index published by The Economist was quite surprising because it said that there were only 20 fully advanced democracies in the world, out of which 10 were monarchies. But what is even more surprising is that out of the five most democratic countries in the world, four were monarchies. So following the famous liberal principle, could monarchies act as an added division of power? The Economist is again a reference as we will be talking about Queen Elizabeth II, but also about Walter Badgett, who was perhaps the most famous director of the newspaper and still holds an important section under his name. So we have a lot of interesting questions to talk about with our guests of today. It is a pleasure for me to welcome Catherine Marshall, who is Professor of Britannic Studies at the CI. I hope I'm pronouncing this world, Sergei, Paris University, and is also director of the Agora Center, as well as director of the program of the Master of Political Ideas in the Digital Age. She even wrote, she was telling me, about Badgett in her PhD. So I'm, I'm delighted to say that she's also a visiting professor at our faculty, and she very recently gave a course titled The UK and the European Union, a misunderstanding. So, Catherine, welcome. Hello. How are you doing? Uh, very well. I'm delighted to have been invited and say thank you very much. I'm very excited uh, about our conversation of today, as I was saying. I don't know if I pronounced everything well in French. I bet I didn't. So please correct me if you want to. Don't worry. It's an impossible name. Sergi Paris University. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. So, Catherine, uh, I was saying briefly before we started our conversation that you're a visiting professor here at our university. You couldn't make it because of COVID this year physically, but you were able to teach the course um, uh, through Zoom and, and the like. I don't know if you'd like to share anything about that before we get started into our conversation. Yes, I mean, even though I was terribly disappointed that I was not able to make it, I mean, I thought that the students were just that wonderful. And I had a, an incredible time, which was complicated because I was teaching in the evening and late at night. And in fact, in the end, it became five evenings, which were extremely good fun. So and um, the exchange on the situation, I mean, the Brexit situation with students not coming from Europe was also uh, um, very useful for me to see that point of view coming from the other side of the planet. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. I think the students really, really enjoyed it. Um, so it's a luxury for us to have you here. Hopefully next year you can come and visit. Hopefully. So um, the, the title of today's conversation is Queen Elizabeth II, a Bagetonian monarch. Um, and maybe the first question I'd like to launch to, to get our conversation started, and maybe before I do that, I'd like to, to remind um, anyone who's watching us through Facebook or YouTube that um, I'll be looking closely at the questions and comments in the chat and hopefully more or less around uh, in half an hour more or less I'll be starting to read um, to Catherine some of the questions online so please join us in, in the conversation and I'll be looking at that. So to, to start uh, Catherine, why um, isn't Badgett outdated? 
Well, the budget, perhaps we have to go back to the beginning. So Walker Badget was this unpronounceable name. So uh, he's well known as the, uh, the person who wrote uh, a very famous little book called The English Constitution. So maybe we can go back on the dates of Walter Badgett. I mean, born in 1826, died in 1877. So really a, a figure of the 19th century, but also a figure in many ways, because essentially, even though he's remembered for that book, The English Constitution, he is, was not a constitutionalist. He was essentially a journalist. Um, he had been brought up also as a lawyer. And uh, he was also the banker for his uh, family uh, bank. So, I mean, a, a well-rounded, you, you know, Victorian and somebody uh, that you would actually have expected to know a lot about uh, every single subject. And that's what he used to do. And essentially, he was also editor of The Economist, as you uh, as you reminded us. So, um, because he married one of the six daughters of the founder, James Wilson. And so, uh, basically, a key figure of the 19th century who wrote uh, a number of articles which were read uh, uh, at the time. And so uh, the English Constitution came out uh, as a number of articles which were read and was supposed to explain uh, the uncodified Constitution to normal people, basically people who were sufficiently educated to understand the ways in which the system was supposed to be working. So in some sort of way, you can say that he oversimplified the English Constitution uh, for uh, a number of people who immediately felt that they could understand it because made this simple. So you would notice also that he didn't call it the British Constitution. He didn't call it the Anglo-British Constitution. He called it the English Constitution. So uh, already in itself, he was actually showing that the, uh, the English aspect was dominating the rest of the nations. So it's a very famous book for those of you who've read it, or if you haven't, I mean, I would highly recommend it. It's not very long. Um, it's still useful, even though it's slightly outdated, I mean, uh, but it is especially useful in order to understand what is, for Walter Badgett, the fusion of powers in the English Constitution, in which he meant that instead of having a separation of powers, as uh, Montesquieu had sought, or people who read Montesquieu had sought, uh, Badgett thought that the powers in the English constitution, so the legislative, the judiciary, and the executive, were fused, and at the center of this, you had the queen at the time, Victoria, and also at the time you had the Lord Chancellor. So you had a sort of, of structure which was fused and which worked in this way without being codified. So for those of you who've read him, you will remember one thing, which is, which is um, his separation of powers between the efficient powers um, and the dignified parts of the constitution. So the dignified parts were the monarchy in the House of Lords and efficient parts, uh, the cabinet and the House of Commons. Okay, why, why, why do you think it's relevant when reflecting on Queen Elizabeth II? And maybe united to this question, what powers should the sovereign have in a constitutional monarchy? Yeah, in, um, in this little book, you've got two chapters on the monarchy, and those chapters are less than 40 pages. But basically, today, if you're going to refer to the British monarchy, you cannot not refer to those chapters. Because in fact, you've got that very, very famous sentence uh, by, by Walter Badgett, who, uh, who summarized the powers of the monarch. And he said that in a, a monarchy such as ours, the monarch has got three powers to be consulted, to encourage, and to warn. And he added after that, that uh, a monarch, should, a wise monarch, should not need any other powers. Because basically, if you've got the power to be consulted, if you've got the power to encourage and the power to, to, to warn, you're in a position to do a huge amount. So the reason why I entitled the, the talk for today, Queen Elizabeth II, about Jehoshaphat monarch, is because essentially, at the time, Walter Badgett was supposed to be describing the reign of Queen Victoria. And the reality is that this was not the truth, but he didn't really know it, or he pretended that this was not the case. But what he wrote at the time became a reality with Elizabeth II. And that's what I would like to try and explain today, if you want. Yes, I was, when we were talking about this privately a couple of weeks ago, I was, um, I was then reading the chapters this weekend, 
there's that hilarious section in which he says how nervous the prime ministers are when they're visiting the, the, the monarch and that it's a superior to them in many ways, culturally and historically and so on. And in, in Netflix, in the Netflix series, The Crown, you really get to see what he's saying. And he's, he's sort of laughing to, about uh, Chatham, I think he is, I can't remember the prime minister, saying that he had the tendency of kneeling on, you know, on one knee when, when, uh, when consulting with a monarch. But please, please, please go ahead with that. Yes, in fact, one of the reasons why I thought it would be interesting to talk about this was that essentially for those of you who watch The Crown, and I fear that a generation of students in the future will only remember Queen Elizabeth II because of The Crown. So I would actually encourage you to watch season one and two, but perhaps to be a lot more cautious about season three and four and the other ones coming. Because essentially in season one and two, and I think that some of them are quite good, what you've got you still have got the possibility, you're, too, you're far away. Because obviously enough, what we tend to forget is that Elizabeth II became queen at the young age of 25 in 1952, even though she was crowned the year after in June 19, uh, 1953. And basically what you've got, and if you think about it today, her first prime minister was Winston Churchill. So today it sounds completely outdated. You've got the feeling that, you know, this woman who's still on the throne today, uh, who's about to reach uh, 70 years in power, um, basically is still the, uh, the living memory of uh, Winston Churchill, for example, her first prime minister. But basically, what is interesting about Elizabeth II is that um, she embodies what Walter Badgett believed that a constitutional monarch should embody. Essentially, in the, in the two chapters, Badgett in the first one explains that, that there are four main reasons uh, for the monarchy to work. And those four reasons are pretty simple. The first one is that a family on the throne is an easy idea. Okay, so basically, it sweetens politics. That's what that's what he says, and uh, it sweetens politics because basically, you've got somebody who's going to get married, somebody who's going to die. This are going to this is going to please people. Okay, and there's going to be if you know how to uh, to use uh, uh, pomp and circumstance, uh, uh, and you know we've just seen it in the in the in the funeral of uh, of Prince Philip. You can actually really gather the nation together around the family, feeling that this is part of your family. That's the first thing. And at the time of Queen Victoria, I mean, she had, had nine children. Okay, she was this sort of figure with her husband before he died in 1861. And she embodied basically this mother of the nation. And on top of it all, as you know, Victoria also became the grandmother of Europe through her children and various grandchildren. Then the second reason, so after a family on the throne is an easy idea, the second reason is the fact that. Uh, the, uh, it strengthens government because of the strength of religion, because the monarch in a constitutional monarchy such as uh, Britain is the head of the Church of England. So uh, the monarch is naturally at the heart of uh, what was, especially in the 19th century, this important religion. It's less the case today. This is something that we might have to discuss with Prince Charles, but it's still very important. Then the third reason is that that person is head of society in the sense that it is a, a, a union uh, of people for amusement and conversation. You're going to talk about uh, the crowd. And then the fourth point is that it is a head of morality. And so here it is, it, the, the, the monarch acts as a sort of formal, grave person, basically. That person is going to be re reliable, not necessarily exciting, but reliable. And you can see this, for example, if you, I mean, I don't know if you saw this, but a lot of people were more touched by the presentation, the idea, the moment when the Queen appeared to talk about the situation at the time of COVID last year, than by Boris Johnson, because there was something about a way of talking about this, which meant that you stop, you listen, and you think, okay, this is important. So four points, basically a family on the throne, an easy idea, the fact that it is the, the person is the head of religion, that the head of society and the head of morality, those four points mean that it acts as a disguise for the efficient parts of government. So in the 19th century, the idea was to say, well, if you've got a, 
a family on the throne like Queen Victoria and her husband. And basically what you've got are people who are, you know, losing space for the real efficient part of government to carry on away from what was at the time the mass. Okay, this is the word that Badgett used. The funny thing is, is that Walter Badgett was describing a sort of power which was, um, you know, influential. But the reality, and that's what he was trying to say, is that those four conditions are going to preserve deference. And deference is really the essential condition of political stability in an uncodified structure. But the thing is, is that Badgett was wrong. And you, we would not know this if, in fact, the letters of Queen Victoria had not been published at the beginning of the 20th century. They were published between 1910 and 1936. And those nine volumes of letters, even though they were edited, actually proved that Queen Victoria was not exactly above parties, um, was not exactly a figure of unity in the sense that she was very pro-conservative, especially after her relationship with the Prime Minister the Israeli, okay, and after the death of Prince Albert. So what you have got in the letters at the beginning of the 20th century is a description of a monarch who is not exactly a Bagiotian monarch. So the structure is how did Elizabeth II become a Bagiotian monarch? And that's when, in fact, things get really quite interesting, is that you realize that the 40 pages on the monarchy and the little book, the English constitution, was given to the future monarchs to read as a sort of um, constitutional guide. And so basically, the grandchild of Queen Victoria, so uh, George V, at the beginning of the, 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 the 20th century, but in fact, starting from the end of the 19th century, was given the English constitution to read in order for him to understand his role in the constitutional monarchy. And then the children of George V, so let's, re let's remember George V's reign from 1910 to 1936. Again, his two boys, so Edward VIII, who, uh, who was on the throne for only a year in 1936, and then his second boy, Prince Albert, who became George VI, uh, who was the father of Elizabeth II. Both of them were brought up on the English constitution, uh, reading it. And then that becomes much more interesting. Elizabeth herself, Elizabeth II, wasn't schooled in the way in which a number of people are schooled today. She wasn't, she didn't go to school in the way uh, we think she did. You can see this in the crown. However, she had a private tutor who was, of course, the head of Eton. And he gave her to read the English constitution. And like her father, her uncle, and her grandfather, she actually annotated the English constitution in order to understand her role. So funnily enough, it is the book itself which became a reality in the 20th century. And she has kept scrupulously to the line of what Badgett had been saying. And that's when you realize that her role to encourage, to advise, and to warn has been at the heart of her life. And that this was also given to her son, the Prince Charles, who was also brought up on this little book. And essentially, it's just as if the book itself became reality. Hmm. It's fascinating. I, I had a question when I was reading it, um, and I wanted to ask you, he plays, so Badgett plays a lot with the, with the idea of having a visible power that people can really relate to because it's understandable. Uh, people understand family, as you were saying, whereas the complex system of Westminster on how it's working, how the bill gets passed and all of that, it's a bit abstract, technical, boring. Um, but at the same time, he makes a lot of emphasis on that the monarch's power should be invisible. Hmm. So could you, could you maybe describe a little bit more any of this or how did you interpret that mix between what needs to be visible and what needs to be invisible of a monarchy? 
basically, Bajit says that you can never set daylight upon magic. And this is a sentence which is going to come back all over again. And you do understand this today, for example, with what is happening with Harry and Meghan. And Meghan. But you do understand how also how important this was at the time of the divorce of Prince Charles and Princess Diana. And you do understand this if you go back. For example, uh, one of the mistakes, I think, uh, was certainly, even though this, this was a desire by Prince Philip at the end of the 1960s, was to open up the monarchy to, um, to TVs and to documentaries made about, about, on them. And so you, you had this famous documentary, The Royal Family, which was filmed at the end of the 1960s and which showed uh, the royal family um, having a barbecue, uh, eating sausages, uh, or uh, the queen actually putting olive oil on her salad. And, and what happened is that people were absolutely fascinated. It was watched by millions of people. But immediately they realized that, that, they, that this, the power of this was that it, in some sort of way, it put the royal family on the level of normal people that yes they would actually have a barbecue yes they would actually put olive oil on their salad and yes they might actually sit on the floor in order to have a picnic but this is not what you want to see from the monarchy so today if you try and look for the documentary it has been sealed away you can only find the three minutes online or two rows of three minutes online but you're not going to find anything else it's been literally locked away what is quite remarkable is that this year the whole of it appeared on YouTube for the whole hour and it disappeared immediately and I was not able to see it. It's been, the, it's been the, 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 the hope of my life to see it because in fact, apparently so many people saw it and were, so it was so over too much, basically. And I think Badgett was right, is that you should not let daylight upon magic. If you want magic to be there, it has got to be stage managed. And that's why if you notice the way in which uh, for example, the funeral of Prince Philip took place. There are certain moments which were cut off. Uh, for example, the moment when uh, um, the family was left for, 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 the, for the body to be, to, to be put down into the crypt. And so you have to leave the power of the imagination behind all this. And uh, you cannot have a monarchy if you do not have this. And the Queen has been considerate enough and careful enough to understand this over the years. However, the question is, uh, will the next generation be able to do this, especially in, in an age in which they are, they are not protected the way, in the way in which they used to? So Budget was right, is that if you want to, 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 re, to gain something, you have to leave part of it secret, okay? It's like a, a sort of perfect love because you are going to imagine and the power of imagination is going to be more important. And so what Badger is also saying about imagination is what we were saying a minute ago while we were talking about this is that he bases the whole of the monarchy on what is essentially a national character. And this national character of the English, because he's not talking about the British, he's talking about the English, is based on centuries of having had a monarchy going back to the Norman, to the Saxon and the Norman kings, Norman, and, 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 and basically what you've got is, is, a, is the power of a mythical um, character. And that's what the, the, constitution, the constitution is relying on, that essentially you don't need to write it down like in the French system, uh, because in fact it's there. And that's what deference is all about. Mm, that's fascinating. Well, so let's get if, if you want to a little bit. You were opening that question up, um, and I'd like to go down that path for a bit. What do you think will happen when um, Queen Elizabeth II dies? Okay, so that's a, a really good question because, in fact, this afternoon reading again the two uh, the two chapters on the monarchy. I'm sorry, but okay. So this is the English Constitution. It's a very little book, but I can't help reading that part to you. So remember that Prince Charles uh, is over seventy, and Badgett wrote. Uh, so it is a prince come young to the throne, but the case is worse when he comes to it to it to it old or middle aged. He is then unfit to work. 
he would then have spent the whole of his youth and the first part of manhood in idleness. And it is unnatural to expect him to labor. Such kings will not be among God's greatest gifts. So I was reading this and I was thinking to myself, it's a bit unfair because in fact, essentially it's not Prince Charles' fault if his mother is going on forever. Um, so the reality is that Prince Charles, I think over the years has shown that he could create a niche for himself, especially in the Prince's Trust and in the huge amount of good he's done over this charity in order to try and help young people who were out of difficult and troubled backgrounds. He's also put a huge amount of energy in green causes, in organic causes, and etc. The reality is that he is taking on a bit of power at the moment because, of course, his mother, well, is now somebody who is aged, but she has said from the beginning that she would not abdicate. So basically, she's going to carry on until she dies. So then it depends about whether or not he will have enough time to be the king that he wants to be, because obviously enough, he will be already quite he will be late in his years. So it's not certain what he will be. First of all, we don't know whether or not he will be Charles III. That's the way people call him. But he himself has said that he would rather not be Charles III because, in fact, the second, Charles II ended up on the scaffold. So perhaps he'll be something else. Perhaps he'll be uh, George VII. Okay? We, he can choose another name, and this will be very important and will actually uh, guide us uh, according to what he would like to be. And of course, there is the question of whether or not his wife, uh, the Duchess of Cornwall, will become queen, because there was always this problem about the fact that the Duchess of Corn Corn Cornwall is being perceived um, as uh, the person who wrecked uh, the, the, the marriage. And this has been coming out very much in the, uh, in the crown. And that's why, personally, I think that season three and four, and now five and certainly six, uh, would be very and perhaps not damaging, because I don't know to what extent you can say it's damaging, but certainly will bring back memories which perhaps would have been better, you know, in the background. So this will be the second question. And then he himself has said that he would not be um, governor of the Church of England. He said that he would be governor of the faith. And that's very important because basically uh, he would not want to be perhaps the governor of... Um, I mean, um, of, uh, of what would be uh, one face, but several face. So this actually would really transform the way in which the power, the function of the monarchy would hold, because he would no longer be head of the Church of England, even though this is essential. He would be perhaps something else. So perhaps he has changed. That's what he said a few years ago. Perhaps he will change once he becomes the king. We also know that he'd been sending a number of letters to ministers, trying to be influential. Um, and but perhaps he'll be a different type of king. So this is unclear. However, there is one thing for sure: he will be an old king. Absolutely. And Catherine, what do you think about sort of? I interpreted, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, please. But he was saying something, and he's sort of hundred and something years in advance of the theory that political systems work where they work and you just can't export them like democracy into the Middle East or the English system and just put it down whatever you want to because it's not going to work. But from a utilitarian, and he's not just making a utilitarian, but from a utilitarian perspective, what are the benefits of a monarchy as, as a system, as a political system? You're right. I mean, essentially, Walter Badgett really felt that any type of structure which had been created rationally uh, had got a sort of potential danger because essentially institutions for him grew out of the history of a nation. And that in this sense, that's why most of his work is always a comparison between France and Britain or between uh, Britain and America. Uh, he's he's not as, as as harsh on America as he's on France because obviously now what he's saying about France is that France is a counterexample. So in this sense, he's very much in the line of Edmund Burke. He's saying basically, if cut was their past in such a sense that they basically they created instability, and he was right because in the 19th century France was really a very unstable system. And um, so what Badger is saying is that. 
basically you cannot theorize politics you've got to you, you've got to allow politics to grow out of a structure out of, of, of what you have been and in this sense if you've got a monarchy it's better to keep it so that's why in the 19th century what he's saying even though he was very critical of the monarchy and that's why most people don't understand this but Bukovic was not saying that the monarchy was the best thing possible he was saying that essentially it was the best thing possible at the time and it was the best thing possible because in fact people were not sufficiently educated to understand what a parliamentary government was all about so what he was saying is that um, essentially Britain at the time was a disguised re republic, but people were not sufficiently educated in order to understand that it would be better to have a republic. That's why I believe that what Badgett was saying was that essentially the best structure would be a republic if you had people who were sufficiently enlightened to understand how to work with a republic. The problem with France was that they had a republic, but they were not sufficiently enlightened to understand how this should work. So basically what he was saying is that in France, you had a disguised monarchy. And I think he's absolutely right. If you look at the way in which today, for example, somebody like Emmanuel Macron leads France, there is very much a sort of Jupiterian monarch, the way that's what he called himself. And you would that very much have a disguised republic in Britain. And in this sense, Badgett really had understood this. So um, I would say that if you've got a monarchy, and that it is based on centuries of, uh, of, um, of acute uh, deferential respect, that obviously enough you should carry on. But the question is, should you carry on with a bad monarch? It's all very well if you've got somebody like Elizabeth II who's devoted her life to the nation. But what do you do if you've got somebody like um, the Spanish king, who perhaps at the beginning was great, uh, and then Juan Carlos then turned into somebody who was no longer acceptable because of what he had done, which was not being respectful of his role. And so then, in fact, this turns things into something else that what do you do with a bad king? And if in a constitutional monarchy, if you've got a bad king, well, basically, either you do what Juan Carlos did and you abdicate, because in fact, you abdicate out of shame, or basically, uh, well, hopefully something's going to happen to you and you're going to die quickly enough to be replaced. But there is this element that you are actually either dealt a good king or a, or a good queen or not. And certainly in the case of the British, nobody, I think, would say that they were dealt a bad queen. Um, I mean, I think that even uh, fierce Republicans would not say that they want a republic today. They might say so when the Queen dies, but I don't think anybody would say so today in view of the immense uh, amount of work that Elizabeth II that has, has given to, uh, to, uh, to her nation. Mm, it's curious because Spain went, or I think people feel in Spain like they've been dealt a good king now that Juan Carlos has gone. So, it's gone for the better, like everyone really agrees in, in how well prepared, uh, for example, his speech during the, the, the crisis in Catalonia really united the nation around him from a non-political perspective, as Patrick is, is writing in the sense of unity and um, re, so the ultimate representative of, of, of the country, regardless of, of what's going on. But there's an interesting thing because I see a lot of Machiavellian ideas in Badgett, the importance of the mask, for example, that people see what you want them to see when you're a good actor. And I find that fascinating. And I wonder what that means um, for the age in which we're at. But before I continue with my comments and question that's coming, I just want to remind uh, our viewers that I'm still looking at our at YouTube and Facebook, if you want to launch any questions to Catherine. Um, lo digo en español también. Estamos viendo en YouTube y en Facebook. Si queréis hacer alguna pregunta a Catherine, yo la voy a ir pasando ahora en unos minutos, que, que termino el cierre. So, Catherine, I was saying also, what happens with this mask? Because part of the sort of the dreams of, of um, the Enlightenment is that with the encyclopedia and people being able to read and write, and being informed that this problem was going to be over, that you could create a sort of a rational st structured government where there would be no sort of irrational, passionate parties 
fighting for political power and all that. Um, and you seem to say that Badges is saying, oh, we're not really ready yet um, at the end of the 19th century for this because people don't know enough. Do you think we're ready for that in 2021? What I can say is that even though you've got a number of people who are, of course, much more educated than in the 19th century and that the democratization of power has taken place and now you've got so many people who are able to vote after the age of 18, I would say that they decided not to get rid of the monarchy. So in this sense, um, what it was wrong is that he saw that his education, that was the power, I mean, the possibility of voting, people would then understand that this was a sort of perhaps a, that it was, it, was, it was there in order to please the people. But perhaps what he hadn't seen, and which was described in the 1960s in one of the introductions of, um, of because most of the introductions to the English constitutions are very interesting. You could actually write a book on the introductions which were written over the, the, over the, the, the period. Because Richard Crossman in the 1960s, who was a Labour politician, wrote a very famous um, introduction to the English constitution. And he said that, uh, what Badgett had not seen is that people could decide to keep the monarchy just out of love. And that, as you rightly said, that the, the sort of Machiavelli in, in, in Badgett uh, is there, that there's a sort of ruthlessness. Um, but it's a ruthlessness which is also in the monarchy. I mean, um, you know, a minute ago we were talking about Juan Carlos and Prince uh, and, and, Queen, um, and, um, and King Felipe. But I mean, he understood immediately that he had to get rid of his father, but he also understood that he had to get rid of his sisters. The same way, basically, today in the British monarchy, Prince uh, Charles uh, and Prince William had understood that they better get rid of uh, Prince Harry pretty quickly, or that they have to get rid of Prince Andrew pretty quickly. Basically, it's a sort of type of ruthlessness to survive, which is there. And uh, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, under the niceties, you actually realize that in order to survive, uh, uh, you can actually cut down the royal family and actually focus on those who are doing the job, because if not, they are they're going to be in danger. And uh, you, you could see this in Spain, definitely. And you can see it also, I think, in Britain. So, yes. But then going back to the other side, which is that perhaps people just love the monarchy. I think that why would this be? You know, why would this be unacceptable? Why would this be funny? Um, I mean, there are aspects of the monarchy that actually I think are very useful. I mean, for example, at the time of the, the, the 40th uh, anniversary of uh, the Queen uh, on the throne in 1992, Anthony Jay, who had been working for the Queen, decided to uh, try and to modernize what Walter Badgett had said. And so he came up with the fact that uh, the, the, the main role of the monarchy the, at the end of the 20th century should be that the queen should no longer be only head of the state and head of the church, but the queen should also be head of the nation. And that this was really the part on which, uh, uh, the, I mean, the, the new monarchy should focus. And so basically, whilst using the formal powers described by Walter Badgett, Anthony Jay added in his book, uh, 14 informal duties so going from uh, uniting the nation to continuity. But then he added also 10 main qualities that he listed at the end of the book, which are actually, I think, as important. So things such as politeness, affability, avoidance of controversy, attendance to duty, emotional sensitivity, moral propriety, conspicuous thrift, financial rectitude, and I think I've forgotten some more. But basically, what would be the qualities of somebody who basically would act with ethics? And it is surprising that he had to write them down, because essentially this is something you would not have, said to, to, you, you would not have needed to have said before. But the fact that they have been written down means today that the future monarchs have got to carry on with those main qualities in order to keep the link, the personal link between the monarch and the people. And I think that this is something which will certainly be at the heart of um, Prince, um, Prince Charles becoming king, uh, because everybody would expect him to react and to behave the way his mother had done. And this is going to be very difficult because she's, she was a woman from another generation. Today, it would be very difficult to find somebody who is going to sacrifice themselves the way she did. 
So I'm, I'm going to be very interested in seeing what is going to happen. Mm, yeah, indeed. That's going to be interesting. And probably it's not very long from now, so... I mean, obviously yeah. not. I mean, I mean, that's what I was telling the students, is that, I mean, I was born with only one queen, and in that case, they would certainly see two coronations. Because, in fact, there are very few people today who remember the coronation of June 1953. Uh, I mean, I've spoken to a number of people who are dead today who told me about it and how amazing this was. And I mean, I wonder what it's going to be like today. I mean, but you will have two certainly coronations in the next 40 years, because obviously enough, uh, Prince Charles being over 70 will, I mean, except if he goes on like his mother. But I mean, you know, it, it still means that he, in 30 years time, you would have a second coronation with Prince William. So this is going to be very interesting. I mean, in, in seeing the way in which uh, they will transform perhaps uh, the, the coronation oath itself. I mean, in 53, what had been kept was a very medieval uh, ceremony which had been created, uh, something which was imagined. And uh, even, you know, the moment of the anointment had been, uh, extra, you know, if you look at it today, you're, you're touched and the moment in which the ring, which is supposed to signify the fact that you're, you're being wed to your people and, the, the, you know, the immense pressure on this young woman. And of course, what we tend to forget is that this is the reign of Elizabeth II, but Elizabeth I was this sort of incredible uh, monarch of the 16th century who reigned for uh, 45 years and it was also a very young queen at the age of 18 and so there was this whole mythology of the name behind it it was the new Elizabethan Eliz Eliz sorry Elizabethan age uh, after the second world war because of course it, we tend to, to also not remember this but 53 the country was still uh, recovering from the second world war I mean, this was really the moment which was marking the coming out of what had been this very difficult period. And so um, I wonder what the, the new age will be. will be marking the age of the Elizabethan age. Um. Oh, indeed. OK, so Catherine, I've got a lot more questions, but I'm going to turn now on to um, reading on Facebook and YouTube so um, we can talk a bit with our viewers. Um, Sophia asks on Facebook if, if you think that the monarchy should reinvent itself. I always hear this everywhere on TV, on the newspapers and everything. I don't know how much of a cliche this reinvention is, and it tends to be, after reading Badgett, of course, I think, it tends to be something about tearing down the mask normally, like democratize, open up, as you're saying. But, well, what do you think? This, the question is for you, it's not really for me. Well, the thing is, I think you're right, is that it's, it's, it's dangerous, is that you, you can see that they, they've done mistakes, okay, so for example, they made the mistakes of opening up and having that documentary in the 1960s, they made other mistakes, for example, in the 1990s, when they appeared on TV, on a TV uh, um, a funny show, I mean, they appeared, I mean, uh, I mean Prince Andrew uh, and, uh, and Princess Anne, and it was a mistake, basically, uh, you've got to find a sort of thin line in which you are seen without giving too much away. I think um, the re reinvention of the monarchy is taking place at the moment in what, for example, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are doing, is that they have understood that they have to give a bit away without giving too much away. That's the reason why you have, for example, the Duchess of Cambridge taking pictures herself of her children, of her family, and putting them on Instagram. But I just, so, you know, this basically she's keeping the possibility of, of showing a bit of her family without giving too much away and the way she wants to do it. Basically, she's the one taking the pictures. So you have got this, um, this moment in which they are learning uh, how to work with social media. And uh, I think that the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are finding the sort of fine balance in not giving the life of their children away, but at the same time, giving a bit away in order for the nation to still be wanting to carry on, because that's the thin line. The main problem, I think, at the moment is what you're seeing, is what is happening with the oversharing of Prince Harry. Um, in um, what is a very un-English way, 
if you're from a certain generation, what he's doing is totally unacceptable, is treason. If you're younger, you think, oh, he's speaking his mind and he's right. Yes, but the thing is, he's also saying that the institution created a number of people who were psychologically flawed, and this doesn't look good. So basically, you need to find a thin balance. So to answer Sophia's question, Sophia, um, I would say that they will have to reinvent themselves because of social media and because of the way in which things are working. But they have to keep in mind what Badgett was saying. You can never let daylight upon magic. If not, it dies. And anyway, I would say this to most people. You should never let daylight upon magic, <laughs> including, including in your relationships. Because in fact, it dies away. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And um, now, okay, it's Lisa's asking on YouTube, what would be the impact? I think she, you, you commented on this, but I think they want a bit more of an input on it. What would be the impact of a new generation taking place of the monarchy? So, obviously, enough, the new generation. I mean, there are a number of people who say that. Uh, the best thing would be to switch a generation. But the reality is that this is not possible in except if Prince Charles decides to abdicate. And he would not, not do this. He's been waiting for this the whole of his life. So why would he do it? But, okay, I mean, uh, the reality is that Prince William, so the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, are really perceived as a uh, the starlight generation. Basically, they've got three adorable children and a dog. I mean, uh, the Duchess of Cambridge has understood all the tricks of the trade. Uh, I mean, gives away without saying too much. Basically, the whole point is you've got no political opinions. You've got no opinions whatsoever. You're just there to actually be, uh, to do your duty to the nation. And she seems to be really understanding this. To what mental cost, who knows? what personal cost who knows but the new generation seems to be actually getting it very right the reality is that those are normal people and uh that's what we tend to forget and that's what you realize with prince harry is that if they decide to actually uh spill the beans you've got the over dramatic uh podcasts of prince harry in which you're thinking what is he doing um, <laughs> He's destroying the monarchy. And uh, to a certain extent, I'm wondering about the crown. Because a number of people are saying that it has got no impact. But I've seen a number of my students saying, oh, poor Diana, she didn't deserve this. And then there's a part of you thinking, but what do you know? This is not fully the truth. So we're going to have a, a number of people, of a sort of new generation of people who would actually think that they understand the reign of Elizabeth II through the crown. And that's what I've been slightly concerned with, actually, uh, even though they're never going to complain about this because it's very British, stiff upper lip. You know, it's uh, never complain, never explain. But we'll see. Mm. Why, why do you think, you've talked about that uh, during the, the talk, our conversation, but why do you think that the first two seasons are good and then is it because we don't have sufficient historical evidence or is it the bias of, you know, biased director? Why do you think that, that right. happens in, in the series of The Crown? So the person who's been writing uh, the, uh, the 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 um, uh, in the the scenario, I mean, in in the first and second series, is basing he, he he was basing his facts on essentially sources which had been declassified, because it's more than fifty years ago. So basically, what you have at the heart of season one and two, especially, are a number of really very some some um, some episodes are very good. There is one on Walter Badgett, which is which is I think very good. Um, and um, which are, I mean, perhaps not of it, not all of it is faithful to reality, but there is a certain faithfulness to reality which is really working, which doesn't really appear in season three and four, because what you've got in season three and four is a sort of sensationalization of power. It's sort of like um, what you've got is uh, um, the focus on uh, the sordid aspects of certain lives, the lives of the life of Princess Margaret. Uh, 
being an alcoholic, uh, uh, the life of Diana being a bulimiac and anorexic. And then you're thinking, for me, for example, this is not necessarily what I'm most interested in. I can understand why this can be in, in, interesting, but I do find, for example, uh, the queen understanding her role uh, in season one and two uh, much more compelling. So I use uh, some of the episodes with my students uh, and then I ask them to watch three and four to actually then show them the amount of mistakes there are in three and four. Now, I'm actually quite concerned about five and six <laughs> coming because the closer you come to uh, what is essentially our contemporary life, the less uh, factual sources you've got, uh, you have got. So you're actually, you're actually basing most of what you're, you're writing on what is uh, not history, it's, uh, it's journalism. Mm, indeed. Okay. So, Catherine, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been very interesting to talk to you about the monarchy and Queen Elizabeth II and budget. Uh, we'll be talking tomorrow at the same time on, on, our, on our Instagram um, about your new book. Um, and I just wanted to, to invite anyone else who's been following us here too. Uh, we're at, at Facebook, we're ufm.epri. At um, Instagram, we're also epri um, slash ufm. We'll be having an Instagram live, by the way, so you can you can um, look at us on, on on Instagram. And that's all for now. Thank you for joining us. Um, please visit our web website too to look at other events and interviews that we'll be organising during this month at epri.ufm.edu. It's been a pleasure to to be here today with you, Catherine, and I'm hoping to see you tomorrow too. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. De nada. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Antigua is such an amazing and special place. An absolutely beautiful location. We're outside in nature. Ha sido dos días en los que hemos dado un repaso a todo lo que es la Marroquín y también un repaso a todo lo que creemos que debería ser. The co-creation forum is, I think, the perfect instrument for achieving true freedom of the exchange of ideas and increasing the knowledge that we have. Hay que estar abiertos al descubrimiento de nuevas ideas. En estudios políticos y relaciones internacionales de la Universidad Francisco Marroquín, los estudiantes son los dueños de su proyecto académico. Cuando uno agrega más mentes al proceso, uno sale enriquecido porque descubre métodos que, que no hubiese pensado por sí solo. Una apasionante experiencia de co-creación y co-creatividad en la que personas de diferentes partes del mundo venían a crear la carrera del futuro. 67 participantes pensando en el futuro de EPRI. It's a really interesting opportunity to engage with people in a sort of bottom-up way to ask and try to provide some answers to important questions about education and society. My expectations were actually superseded by reality, that the reality actually worked a lot better. La universidad es un lugar de innovación. En cuanto deja de ser un lugar de innovación, deja de ser universidad. Por eso innovación y universidad son la misma cosa. This event is putting Francisco Marroquín and the networks of scholars in Guatemala, students are on the international map. The future is very bright for EPRI and very bright for UFM.